Welcome back to Light the Fuse, Charles. It's good to see you. I know we were both kind of out of it for a little while, so I'm, I'm glad that we're both well enough to do this podcast and to, <laughs> you know. We've been each dealing with our own medical emergencies. We're, we're fine. <laughs> Everybody's, if everything's good, we're okay. We're going to survive. We're all good. But uh, we've, we've had, it's been, a, it's been a crazy week, and I, and I will say that... Um, it's all, you know, everything is really great today because what did we get in the mail today, Drew? Oh, my God. Well, let me tell you the story, Charles. So I was on a call. I haven't even told you this. This will be new to you. And I get a call and it is somebody from Tom Cruise's office. And I say, oh, hello. And they said, oh, I'm outside your building. Do you want to come down and let me in? And I opened the door, and what was it, Charles? What, what did we see? Did you know? Did you know what it was at that moment when he, when they called? I had no idea. I, you know, anytime anybody calls me, I think I'm in trouble for something. <laughs> so I was just, you know. And to get the setup, Eddie Hamilton asked us earlier in the week for our addresses, and we didn't know why. I thought maybe Eddie was going to send us a Christmas card or something. I had no me idea. Me too. Me too. Uh, and then yeah, so you got it, and then I saw the photo that you posted on Twitter, and then I was like, oh my god. So I got it later in the in the day. Uh, so a nice guy came over and, and yeah, he had like a, a van and he was just delivering cakes. We got the we got the Tom Cruise cake. That's that's what happened. And you know what? There are multiple sizes of the cake, and we got the tippity top biggest one. It's huge. Yeah. There's no way I can finish this cake. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm gonna cut it in half and freeze. I'm gonna freeze half, maybe even three quarters of it. It's gigantic. It's like your wedding cake. We should freeze it, and this is a suggestion by Carly Wiesel. She said, freeze it and eat it at the premiere of Dead Reckoning Part 1, which I think is a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, and uh, speaking of Dead Reckoning Part 1, today we've got a special treat for everybody. I'm sure you've already seen it from the title of the episode, Christopher McCory who was in South Africa shooting Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning when we bothered him to come back on our show again to talk about Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher came out 10 years ago this month. It was uh, December 2012 that it came out. Uh, I'm sure. What was the exact release date? It was late in December. I think it was like the 19th. Maybe the 17th or something. It was late. So anyway, we've got McCory coming on here for the next three weeks. We've got a three-part epic interview with him where we talk about everything Jack Reacher. I loved this conversation. I, I, you know, we haven't really talked to him Either either of us, you know, in our personal lives or on the show about the movie, and I haven't really heard him talk about it that much. And yeah, we love the movie, and it was obviously very important. It was his first, you know, directorial collaboration with Cruz, and his first directorial effort since Way of the Gun. So yeah, it's a really great chat. It's an important movie and a really interesting movie in his filmography. And yeah, I was excited to go back and I revisited it before we talked to him. And it's just, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. It's another Tom Cruise action movie that's directed by Christopher McQuarrie, obviously based on the books. Uh, but this was a crazy chat we had because he was in South Africa shooting Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. You were in London for the Avatar premiere, and I was in Los Angeles. It was kind of a miracle <laughs> that we were able to coordinate the timing of this yeah. and make it happen. But uh, this is an ama amazing chat. Part one is mostly about how McQuarrie got, got onto the project and his approach to the material. And then we'll debrief it afterwards, and then there's there's okay. there's pl plenty more to talk about in, in parts two and three. Uh, so yeah, enjoy this. And and before we start, obviously, uh, oh, yeah. you should don't, do your Charles, part of the Charles, don't cut me off here. Come oh, on, sorry, come, sorry, sorry. Come on, I got to do my shout outs. I obviously this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album, and he wants us to remind everybody to listen to his making of Better Call Saul episodes. Uh, also, this episode is brought to you by John B. Uh, Elvis Ripley and Suchet. So thank you all so much. We could not do this podcast without you. Okay, Charles, now I'm done. So if you want to throw to the interview. Hey, yes. Let's go to Christopher McQuarrie on the 10th anniversary of Jack Reacher. Here we go. So we're here to talk about the the tenth anniversary of Jack Reacher. How did how did Jack Reacher come into your life? Um, Jack Reacher came into my life uh, with uh, by way of Don Granger, who uh, is a, a producer on the film uh, and was at the time working for Cruz Wagner, 
or had been working for Cruz Wagner prior to Cruz Wagner becoming United Artists, which then went on to make Valkyrie. And that's where I met Don and worked with him very closely. And when UA was winding down, Don was thinking about, thinking ahead about what was next. And he went through all the old Cruz Wagner material and came to me with a one shot, which was my introduction to Jack Reacher. Um, and Don asked me if I wanted to write the movie to direct. It was actually rewrite the movie. There was a script that existed written by Josh Olson. And he had designs on making this into a franchise. And I said, great, I'm not going to help you with that. <laughs> because, uh, and Don said, why? And I said, because I've been in movie jail since I directed The Way of the Gun. And uh, I've spent the last... 10 years asking for permission to direct movies and I'm not going to do that anymore. Nobody's, nobody's going to offer me the job. And, uh, and he, he was very insistent and I said, look, I'll do it on two conditions. One, you have to convince the studio to offer me the movie to direct because what tended to happen in, in between the way of the gun and, and this moment was I would have movies dangled in front of me and and I would show interest or I would do some development on it. And then they would eventually go to other directors. Um, uh, no Country for Old Men was one of those that, that, that got dangled in front of me. And the whole time they were courting the, the Coen brothers, I was kind of a stalking horse. I was the I was the sea biscuit of, of filmmakers for for other people. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and so I was just, just like, I'm not going to play that game anymore. I'm just, I'm going through the door that opens and I'll take, I'll take real opportunities, but I'm not, I'm just not going to ask permission. And I said, the other thing is, I, I would assume that this is a Cruz Wagner project and Tom Cruise is automatically attached. He's not going to be in a movie that I'm directing. Let's just list some of the directors that Tom has worked with. I'm not on that list. The, the guy who did The Way of the Gun is not going to be there with Scorsese and Coppola and Spielberg. And let's just be real. That's not going to happen. So if you can come to me and say that it's mind free and clear, that there's no one attached and that the studio will offer me the movie to direct, then I'll do it. And I did that thinking I would never hear from Don Granger again on that project. And he came to me a week later and he said, it's yours. And the studio wants you to do it. Now, of course, what that meant was the studio was willing in my mind, the studio was willing to develop the movie, but they were never really going to make it. Um, this was just an opportunity for them to hold on to a piece of material in the event they wanted to make it. Uh, so uh, around that time, I was hired by Fox to write Wolverine, or more accurately, I was hired by, I, I, I was asked to meet Hugh Jackman. And I'd had a very, very difficult experience on the original X-Men and it ended very acrimoniously between me and the studio. And the, but, but, but that had followed me around for about 10 years where I was still hearing stories about you know, the bad blood on X-Men. And uh, John Palermo, who had been an assistant on the original X-Men was now Hugh Jackman's producer. And Hugh Jackman was looking to go back to something more akin to the original X-Men. And he, 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 was, he was saying, I want to get back to the, the spirit of that film. How do we do that? And John Palermo raised his hand and he said, look, the guy you want to be talking to is Chris McQuarrie. What the X-Men kind of took the turn that it did when he came on the project. And I was sort of a, I was sort of a name that nobody mentioned in the room. Uh, after what had happened on X-Men. A lot of bad things went down on X-Men. I'll just summarize it. A lot of bad things went down on X-Men <laughs> for which I was blamed and which which was not the case. Uh, and and But because I wasn't communicating directly with the studio, I was I was used as a scapegoat for a lot of stuff. Uh, so there was, there was just a lot of bad blood and there was no way to ever sort it out. In any case, when I got the call to meet with Hugh Jackman, my first reaction was absolutely not. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. You, you, you know the animal now. You know what to do now. And this is an opportunity to meet Hugh Jackman. So just take it knowing you won't get the job. Uh, and that's what I did. I took the meeting. Uh, and when I walked in, there were, there were individuals in the meeting who, who had been there on X-Men and who quite clearly did not want me to get the job. 
and 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 clearly we're still carrying a lot of the energy 10 years later and i thought i'm going to make you love me despite yourself and i pitched the shit out of wolverine um and unfortunately i got the job which was not my intention my intention was just to just to meet you jackman um and when my lawyer called me he said well you 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 fucked up you got it <laughs> and i said well no just ask for too much money and and then they and then they they won't give me the job and he said no you're going to take the job and you're going to and you're going to and you're going to show them what you can do and so i did that i took wolverine knowing the the mechanism now as i did not then knowing that not a single word of what i wrote would ultimately make it to the screen and because of that i was just free to to deliver. I just said I'm just going to write the best movie that I can. I'm going to get this thing up on its feet. And when it's time for me to go, I will. And that's exactly what I did on Wolverine. And so I was in that state of mind when Jack Reacher came to me, which is you're going to write this movie and no one's ever going to make this movie and just write the best script that you can and don't think about whether or not the movie's going to get made. Uh, and that's stayed with me ever since. That's really been a big part of my philosophy was that when you are trying to, when you're so worried about the outcome, as I was on X-Men, as I was on projects earlier than that, when everything is life and death, you're constantly trying to defend yourself and defend your work as opposed to just doing the best work that you can and solving the studio's problems. And so that's, that's just what I focused on. And Mark Evans, who was the executive at the time, articulated really well at the very beginning of the process. He said what the, he, he, he read the book and he really liked it. He said what the character needs is myth. The character, the, 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 the character, whatever, whatever you do with the character, just give it some sense of myth. And I thought it was a very good note. And I took that to heart. And that became the the construct of the introduction of Jack Reacher. And it's why I think Don's choice of one shot as the book to introduce this character to a bigger audience was the better choice. I know Fran, fans of the, the books and fans of the franchise feel like it should have been the killing floor and it should have been in chronological order, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, fans of the franchise also don't actually have to make movies um, and or understand what is cinematic <laughs> about the books that they love, and and that, and that's that, that's essentially what happened. I wrote the script, and while that was happening, I was writing Wolverine for first for Hugh and then for Darren Aronofsky, and in the midst of all of this, I finished the script and handed it in. And you guys will love this as, as the hosts of Light Diffuse. I handed in the script and the script ultimately went to Tom Cruise, who was the producer on the movie. And Tom called me out of the blue about, about a week after the script went in, which is not something you're expecting to hear back that quickly. And he said, hey, listen, uh, I read Reacher and I loved it. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to talk. I'm, I'm on set right now. But listen, I read the script and I loved it. I want to talk to you about it. Uh, the studio is going to call you tomorrow. I said, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, your studio is going to call you tomorrow. Anyway, listen, I just I just want to call real quick and say, I love the script. I'll talk to you later. I got to go. He hung up. And I thought, wow, that was just, that's amazing that I wrote this script. And a week later, the studio is calling me about it. The next day, Mark Evans called me from Paramount. And he said, okay, listen, so I spoke to Tom. And I think he called you. I said, yes, he did. He said, great, we're gonna send a script over today. I said, you're sending a script? He said, yes, we're, we're sending a script over. I said, what's the script? He goes, he, he, did, he didn't tell you? I said, no, he just called to tell me he liked Jack Reacher and that you would be calling. And he said, yes, we're, we're calling to send a script. I said, what script? He said, Mission Impossible. They're, they're up there in Canada shooting Mission Impossible right now and he wants you to rewrite it. And Tom was so busy that he, he, he kind of missed the headline. And I was being hired to rewrite Ghost Protocol with no mention of Jack Reacher. So <laughs> I, went, I went to Canada and started working on Ghost Pro what would become Ghost Protocol. While I was waiting for notes from Darren Aronofsky on Wolverine and wondering what 
what's going on with Jack Reacher? And my first week on Ghost Protocol was just downloading and digesting the production up to that point and figuring out what have they shot, what haven't they shot, what can be reshot, what can't be. And I was, I, I was learning how to rebuild movies while I was making that movie. And, uh, and, and, and the whole time I was realizing Darren Aronofsky is expecting me to rewrite Wolverine. And on my, on, on, I was only supposed to be on Ghost Protocol for a week and I didn't even start writing until the morning of the seventh day because I had been working to under to grasp the, the movie that had been shot up to then. And on the morning that I sat down to start my writing on Ghost Protocol, Darren Aronofsky called and said, hey, sorry I took so long to get back. I've got notes on Wolverine, when can you start? And I thought, this is terrible. Uh, and so there was, a, there was a little bit of dilemma of how to sort those two things out at the same time. And then I was on set with Tom and we were, we were talking about a scene and he said, by the way, I love Jack Reacher. Uh, we never got to talk about it. I said, no, no, we didn't. He said, but listen, I loved it and I'd love to be in it if you'll have me. Um, <laughs> so now I'm, I'm in this very interesting position of, of all I did was set out to write the movie and now I'm writing Wolverine and Ghost Protocol and Jack Reacher and Tom Cruise wants to be in Jack Reacher. Uh, and it was a really great lesson in terms of not trying to control your destiny and just going through the door that opens, which is something you hear me espouse all the time, was just in just taking the work and trying to do my best. All of these things were happening at the same time. And I wasn't really worried about what the outcome was of any of them beyond doing my best work. Uh, and that was essentially how Jack Reacher came to be. It it. It came, it came to me obliquely, as most things do. Uh, and in fact, in any instance in which I have tried to go directly from the start of something to production has never occurred. It has never come to fruition. All of the movies that I, that I love the most and have always wanted to do and have passionately pushed forward and tried to make never, ever happen. Uh, the only movies that do are the movies where I'm I'm just sort of tinkering with it or, or stepping in to help or or in some way or another kind of trying to back out of the room and and end up getting pulled in. And that's that's how that's the the long version of how Reacher came to be. And did any of your Wolverine stuff make it in? Um while I was writing uh, or while I was getting ready to do Reacher, they started sending me, they sent me a copy of the script. Uh, they sent me a copy of the script have, that had been heavily rewritten. And I think some voiceover of a newscaster uh, from like a couple <laughs> lines of a voiceover a newscaster had ended up in the script. Yeah. And I was offered story credit on the movie. And I honestly, I thought to myself, actually, no, uh, um, the, the, I actually don't deserve the story credit. The story credit goes to Claremont and Miller, who wrote the whole Japanese, uh, the, 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 the Japanese timeline of Wolverine. And there's a weird quirk in how comic book movies are developed that that underlining material is not like a novel. And so you're not entitled to that credit. Uh, and I simply wrote a letter to the guild to that effect and said, this, this would be wrong for me to take it. I don't deserve it. It, it should go to Claremont and Miller. And, um, uh, and, and so I ended up not taking a credit on that movie. But tr and, and truthfully, the story isn't mine. It's Claremont and Miller's. And the, the, the movie that ended up being made was Jim Mangle. There were, there were ghosts of things that we, that Darren Aronofsky and I talked about. And, um, and, and, but I never, I never interacted with Jim on the movie. I was gone by then. Um, but story-wise, I felt like I couldn't take credit. And frankly, I thought, I, I, I maintain that Wolverine is probably the best thing I ever wrote for hire for a studio. Um, it just, it just wasn't, it wasn't what they were looking for. And it's, and I wrote the movie as, as I would have made it. I was not, I, I was not trying to write what I think they were looking for and could not articulate in terms of a big, a big spectacle. The other problem is you're not, when I'm developing a movie like that, I'm not in the room with the director. I'm not developing for a filmmaker. 
And if, and if you're not developing for a filmmaker, you're not really developing a film. You're developing a screenplay. Um, so uh, that just, yeah, no, nothing, nothing of mine ever ended up making, if something did, it's like The Tourist, by the way. Uh, I, I developed The Tourist for Tom. Uh, that was the first thing I developed for Tom after Valkyrie. And I was on that movie through two different directors, several different sets of movie stars, after Tom had decided he wasn't doing it. In fact, when I was doing it, when I was, when I was writing The Tourist, I was in this game of Survivor where they were, there was a story in the press every week about the four or five movies that Tom was circling. And every week, one of them would drop out and you were just waiting to get voted off the island. And he ended up doing a script called Wichita, which became Night and Day and The Tourist, fell apart and then was resurrected. It changed companies. I was a different studio. You name it, every every player changed hands and I just kept ending up on uh, uh, on board uh, and, uh, and then was eventually, uh, I, a, a director got fired. I, and, and then I was involved in helping to cast the, convince the cast to be in the movie. And then that director got rehired and then fired me off the movie. And probably three pages of what I wrote ended up in the movie. And somehow I ended up with writing credit. Now that's the kind of movie where I normally would have said, no, thank you. But I was urged by my reputation. <laughs> they said, this is going to be a big hit movie. Keep your name on it. You, you need a win. And I was like, Any, anytime you see my name on, a, on, on movies, there's a, there's a story behind it, unless it was a movie I developed. And... Um, uh, and that and that was one in which I, in which I left my movie my my name on, but I really didn't I didn't feel entitled to, to writing credit. Uh, so now I'm I'm much more, uh, I'm, I'm much more adamant about it now. Where I just look at it and say, look, I just I, I didn't do I didn't do the work where I feel like I deserve credit. I'm not taking. It. Julian Fellows and I occasionally run into each other and we laugh all the time, going, you know, the, that our names are on that movie. Uh, <laughs> what, the hell, what the hell did we do? And apparently, but apparently, that's what the, the process said. We deserve credit, so I guess, I guess that's how. It well, Tom, Tom has been involved in like, uh, let's say, casting controversies before when he was a, in involved in Interview with the Vampire, and that sort of met with Reacher as well. And I was wondering how you dealt with that, or what your thoughts were. Well, so so Don and I, when when that when it first was when Tom first said, "Hey, listen, I'll be in it if you want me." I said, first of all, you got Tom Cruise asking to be in your movie, which is which is a it's, it's rare and it's and it's a big deal, and you don't look that gift horse in the mouth. But of course, I did. I look at I looked at it and said, "All right, is that the right thing to do? Here's this here's this book, and and it's it's got a dedicated fan base and." You guys know what I think of fan service, and I and I thought, well, let's let's do our due diligence. Is this is he right? And Don and I created a chart of all the actors that we felt, you know, were 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 big enough to carry the movie, and and by big I mean figuratively big enough, and and which ones were big enough literally to play the role. And one of the criteria, the first leveler for us was we thought Jack Reacher needed to be American. He was a distinctly American character. Um, it's very, the, the books are steeped in Americana. And so we felt, we, we kind of leaned towards an American, even though there were a lot of really good Brits and Australians who were on that list. Um, and we graded it, we created a, a chart where you graded it based on physicality, humor, intellect, uh, and I think there were a couple of other things. And we, we gave every, we, you know, we, sort, we scored everybody based on that. And so there were guys who were the right physical size, but didn't necessarily dominate in other categories. And, 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 and to me, Reacher's size is only an aspect of Reacher. And this was very naive of me because in, to the fans of the books, Reacher size is absolutely everything. It's 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 um, it's extremely extremely important to to them, and uh, and so there was this. We we anticipated a visceral reaction, and we went to Lee Child, 
we sat down with him in New York. We had dinner, and Tom and I, or Don and I, brought out this chart, and it and showed Lee. Here's what we're thinking, and Tom wants to do it, and Lee understood that in making the movie this way, you were gonna. He was only going to expand the movie to a bigger audience, and Lee was more than enthusiastic about it. And I said, "What about the fans? You know, you, you, this is your book, and it's your fan base, and." Um, is there any concern that they're going to have a reaction to that? And Lee said, yeah, they probably will. And he, and he told us in a far less diplomatic way than I'm saying to you now, not to worry about the fans, not to, not to concern ourselves with it. So with Lee's blessing, we figured, uh, we figured we were okay and we were good to go. And then I think you, we've, we've spoken in the past about, um, the, you know, the efforts that we made to acknowledge the details of the book and to to make references and winks and nods to the to fans of the franchise, to those people who who know that stuff in detail. And it was all misinterpreted. So the scene where Jack Reacher takes up, where Tom takes off his shirt in the and is washing his shirt in the sink, that's a typical Reacher scene in that it's, it's showing you, A, he has no luggage, he has no spare clothes, this is all he does, he lives in hotels. And also he's got scars all over his body, which are all very specific to other chapters of the Jack Reacher story. All anybody saw was Tom Cruise taking off his shirt in a scene in front of Rosamund Pike. And and I learned to very violent, that, that was it for me. That was the end of fan service for me, where I just said, it's not, it it can it it's fine if you if if the story happens to go there, but to specifically go after that, you do so at your peril because they don't they don't they don't they don't read it that way. They're gonna they're gonna read it with whatever their bias is, and that that was kind of the you know that's why when I get asked about Superman and Star Wars and all those other movies, I'm just like I don't think you want me, fan. If you're a fan, you I don't think you want me to do it. I'm gonna make. I'm going to make Star Wars the, the way I think Star Wars should be made. Now, that that doesn't mean I'm going to put my stamp on it. It means I'm I'm going to go back to the to the egg as I always do with every project I come on to. I'm going to go back to the source and like, you're going to make a movie like 1977 Star Wars or as people call it Episode 4 A New Hope. It's it's Star Wars. That's that's what it is to me. That's that's how I grew up watching it. You're going to go and you're going to make that movie. You're going to make it look like that and feel like that and have that kind of heart and have that kind of emotion. I'm not going to infuse it with the other with the other crap that people insist on injecting into movies these days to to try to make them uh, to, to, to serve a specific demographic of the audience. I make movies for everybody. So I feel like when I get asked about DC and I get asked about Star Wars and other franchises, it's like, I'm sorry, you're the last person I'm making the movie for. I'm making it for a big, wide audience because those are the movies you fell in love with. That's who those movies... Star Wars Episode Four was not made for fans of Star Wars. It was made for the <laughs> audience. And it's like, yeah, it, did, it didn't exist then. And that's, that's, what's, that's what's sort of choking a lot of this franchise stuff to death, I feel, is that they're... They're coalescing an audience. They're taking, they're taking a, a an admittedly large but very distinctly passionate for, portion of the audience and corralling them into a place at the expense of movies in general. I don't want to use the big C word to say cinema, but they're, you, what you're doing is you're cultivating an audience to love a certain kind of film, and and that's why you're that's why you're seeing everything getting. I think that's why you see everything getting swept more and more into this. That's that's why the top 10 movies, uh, the top 10 domestic movies are all science fiction and fantasy and, and things like that. It's because that's that's what everybody's chasing after and that's the that's the audience they're cultivating. That's what movies are becoming. And I'm I I reject that. I, I feel like you can have big commercial movies that are also movies for everybody and not just fans. Right. Uh, and all of that, all of that emanates from a hotel scene in Jack Reacher where I just realized I don't work for you people. I just, I'm never going to do that again. I, I did it. <laughs> I, I tried to, I tried to make a peace offering. You know, I, this is how I could get Jack Reacher made. This is how I could bring your big character, your character to the big screen. 
Um, and and I gave you winks and nods as a as a as a consolation. You rejected it. Great. Now we all know where we stand. I don't work for you guys anymore. I never will. <laughs> wow. And we're back. Wow. That guy. Gotta love him. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, that's... Uh, the, the, the biggest thing for me, had you ever heard that he was working on No Country for Old Men? No. I want to know what else, because he said, you know, there were things that were dangled in front of him, including that one. Yeah. Uh, now we got to know what else. That he, it sounded like he was kind of the bargaining chip to get other people... <laughs> On projects, which is, I, I would have, I mean, obviously, No Country for Old Men, I think is, I would say is a masterpiece. It's a, one of Co- the Coen Brothers' greatest movies, but I would be really interested to see what Christopher McQuarrie would have done with No Country for Old Men. Yes. That's, like, that's a really interesting marriage of material with writer-director, and I think that would be a really fascinating what-if to see. Hey, there, there always can be multiple adaptations. Why, why not, you know, circle we, back to we that always one, talk McQuarrie. About this. Maybe, we could, maybe yeah. he could still make No Country for Old Men. Yes. <laughs> We want to see, like, the same movie remade, like, every five years yes. with different people. Why not? With material yeah. that strong, why not? Um, yeah. ne- next week, we get into details of Jack Reacher, into the making of it. We, we talk about that amazing opening sequence, which is something like eight minutes and 20 seconds with no dialogue. It's so awesome. Just just completely, just totally visual storytelling. We also discuss the incredible car chase, and uh, he goes into detail about my favorite shot in the movie, and then he talks about your favorite shot in the movie. That's all next week, and of course, we've also got a part three coming after that, so there's plenty to come. And can I just, te- can I just tease one thing about part three? Yeah. We get into what this next... Tom Cruise, Christopher McQuarrie project could be. Oh my God. And if you are not so excited by episode three, <laughs> I don't know if you're listening or yeah. not because, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Can't, I'll just tease that. That's a good tease. Yeah. Come on back for that. Um, I've got to give a special thank you to Derek Klingel and to Sonia Miranda. Thank you, Derek and Sonia, for making this episode possible. I also want to credit our editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and our composer, Kevin Blumenfeld. And I also want to thank our intern, Amber Cohen, who is helping us set up a Discord for our Patreon subscribers. So that's a, a good time for me to tell you to sign up for our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash light the fuse. And you get weekly bonus content. We do episodes there every week, uh, always about anything that's going on movie related, uh, anything that's going on with Mission Impossible, anything. We, we talk about all of our favorite movies. I'll, we'll talk about your favorite movies. You can always give us suggestions. So please sign up and support the show. You can also support the show by buying something from our Public store, which is tpublic.com slash user slash light the fuse pod. I think I got that right. If I didn't, then you can go to our website, lightthefusepodcast.com, and in the merch tab, there's a direct link there, along with a few samples there as well. And and while you're on the website, check out our episode guide, look at the show notes for all our episodes. It's a great visual companion to all of this. And what else, Drew? Well, I want to encourage everybody to like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast, and to know that next time you hear us, we probably won't be as congested, I think. I hope. (laughs) You know, we're kind of going through some stuff, but I think we're we're getting get through better, it. I hope, okay. right? Yeah, COVID is yeah. raging through my house right now. Uh, you've got some other flu thing. We're we're getting through yes. it. We're you know what? We're getting through we're it. We're going to be stronger on the other side. It's going to be great. And you are going to be stronger when you come back next week for the awesome part two of this great chat with Christopher McQuarrie. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.